Hi, I'm Chris Green, the History Chap. Just 50 years after William the Conqueror had invaded England, the House of Normandy and the Norman Conquest was in crisis. Because in the dark of the night on the 25th of November 1120, a ship sank in the English Channel, drowning all but one person on board. And as that ship disappeared beneath the waves, so did the heir to the English throne. And England was thrown into its first succession crisis since the Norman Conquest. This is the story of the White Ship. On the 25th of November 1120, a ship called the White Ship left the port of Barfleur near the top of the Cherbourg Peninsula in Normandy, en route for England. Captained by the grandson of the captain who had actually taken William the Conqueror across the Channel back in 1066, the White Ship was the swiftest and newest ship in the Royal Fleet. And on board was William Adeline, or William Aithling, the 17-year-old grandson of that very same William the Conqueror and son and heir of King Henry I of England and Normandy. Now, Henry I himself was, was William the Conqueror's third son. He had inherited the throne when his older brother, William II of England, sometimes called William Rufus, was killed in a hunting accident in the New Forest. A very famous hunting accident because, I, when I say an accident, he was hit by an arrow, which actually wasn't a huge loss as, as Rufus wasn't a particularly popular king. But you might be sniffing a bit of a conspiracy here, you know, hugely unpopular king uh, riding through the New Forest when he's struck by an arrow, fired supposedly by one of the best archers in his hunting party. All very convenient. Especially, as luck would have it, his younger brother Henry just happened to be nearby. So Henry was able to, to ride to Winchester where he secured the royal treasury, and then he rode on to London where he was proclaimed king. And all the time, his brother William's body was lying in the New Forest, you know. We're talking about Henry acting just with a little bit of haste here. And maybe, maybe we should give Henry the benefit of the doubt, because, you know, this is the Middle Ages. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and, you know, someone else was always looking to grab the throne ahead of you. And in this case, it was his oldest brother, Robert Curthose, Duke of Normandy. Now, luckily for Henry, Robert was still on his return journey from the First Crusade in the Holy Land, so if Henry acted quickly, he could, he could present his elder brother with a fait accompli. And so he did. Henry became King Henry I of England. He married the daughter of the King of Scotland, um, who was a direct descendant, incidentally, of Alfred the Great. And that's actually how our current royal family can trace their lineage all the way back to the Anglo-Saxon kings before 1066. The result of this royal marriage was a son and a daughter. The daughter, Matilda, was born in 1102 and was, by the time of our story, married to the Holy Roman Emperor. A year later, Henry I of England had a son. He was named William after his all-conquering grandfather, which brings us to the 25th of November, 1120. The king, his son, and many of the leading nobles of England had been in France, well, in their duchy of Normandy in France. Normandy was a bit of a strange entity because effectively it was an independent duchy, but the kings of France had long argued that it owed, ten, uh, it owed homage to them. But there was no way that Henry, king of England, was going to pay homage to the king of France. Uh, so tensions started to rise between the two, and there's a real serious potential of war, which would be costly, not just in men, but actually in cash as well. So Henry worked up this great diplomatic wheeze. Young William, William Aetheling, would become the Duke of Normandy, and he could swear homage to the French king, and that would get Henry off the hook. Of course, what of Henry's older brother? Remember Robert Curto's Duke of Normandy? Yeah, where was he in this equation? Well. Cutting a long story short, when he came back from the Crusades, he tried to contest Henry's right to the English throne. Uh, he had failed spectacularly and managed to lose the Duchy of Normandy to Henry in the process. And he was now languishing as a prisoner in Cardiff Castle, out of the way. So anyway, in 1120, William Aetheling had crossed the Channel, he'd paid homage to the King of France, and everything was tickety-boo. It was now time to head back to England aboard the fastest ship in the English fleet, the White Ship, captained by Thomas Fitzstephen, relative of the man who had captained William the Conqueror's own ship to the invasion of England back in 1066. Before setting out, however, the teenage prince, you know, William was only 17, and his well, 250 strong entourage and 50 crew spent the afternoon partying with huge amounts of alcohol being consumed. 
young people. They don't change a lot, do they? Uh, his cousin Stephen was with him and actually was drinking so much he actually started to feel a bit queasy. Uh, and that, that, that potential motion of the boat going across the English Channel was enough to make him decide he was going to stay ashore and, and he got off the boat. William's father, King Henry, had already departed on another slower ship with William Aithling's 14-year-old wife. And as darkness fell, the young prince ordered the captain to put to sea in a bid to, well, to catch up his father and overtake him, to get to England first. Yeah, because I mean, that's young people, isn't it? And the 50 oarsmen on the, great, on the white ship pulled away. And if you've ever seen Olymp Olympic rowing, you know, when you see the, like the eights, eight men rowing, how fast they can go. Imagine what you can speed, you can pick up with. This boat was, it was like a Viking longship, okay, with 50 oarsmen pulling on it. And as they left the harbour, they pulled away with all that muscle power. They started to pick up some speed as they headed out into the dark channel, straight into a submerged rock. And there, rammed on the rock, the ship started to take in water and almost immediately started to capsize. Yeah, it was pitch black. There was only a quarter moon that, in the sky that night. And whilst people on the shore could hear the hundreds of people crying for help, they couldn't see where on earth the sinking ship was to actually go and help them. Prince William, supposedly, managed to jump into a small lifeboat, but upon hearing the cries of his half-sister, he supposedly turned back to rescue her. And as his little boat came back to in, through all the, the drowning people, desperate hands grabbed his boat and they, they sank it with the weight. In the dark of the English Channel, the heir to the English throne disappeared under the waves and his body was never recovered. Of the 300 people on the ship, only one person, a butcher by the name of Berold, survived. Uh, and it's his, it's his accounts about William coming back in his lifeboat to rescue his half-sister that, well, we have to take as, as read. As morning broke upon that, that scene of devastation, you know, you can imagine all the jetsam and flotsam stuff, bodies washing in on the shore. You know, the nobles left on the shore, including uh, William's cousin, Stephen, had a terrible problem. Who would tell the king? In fact, initially, no one dared tell Henry, but you know, that's not, it's not really a secret that you can, you can keep for that long, is it? And when he finally, held, when he finally heard the news, he was absolutely grief-stricken. You know, not only as a father who'd lost his son, but of course, as a king of England who'd lost his heir, because he could, who would succeed him? William Aithling's mother uh, had died a few years uh, beforehand, and Henry now sought a new wife, ASAP, to produce another heir. He married a woman called uh, Edeliza of Louvain, who was 17 at the time. Henry was 52. And whilst they spent a lot of time together, she never produced him an heir. So when Henry died 15 years later, in 1135, the succession hadn't actually been resolved. Before his demise, he bequeathed the throne to his only surviving legitimate child, his daughter Matilda. However, in a patriarchal society, the Anglo-Norman barons decided to support the cause of her cousin, Stephen, uh, the son of Henry's sister. Do you remember him, Stephen? He should have been on the white ship, but he had a bit of a dicky tummy. Uh, convenient, maybe, but how was he to know that they were going to go ploughing into a rock off the coast there, uh, even though they were all completely drunk? Anyway, Stephen was proclaimed king, and a civil war broke out between Stephen and Matilda. Uh, because she believed she was the rightful heir to the throne. Uh, and that civil war was called the Anarchy. Neither side could land a lockout blow, and eventually they came to an agreement that when Stephen died, Matilda's son from her second marriage by now, uh, a man called Henry of Anjou, would become king. And he did. And we know him as King Henry II of England, the first of the royal house of Plantagenet. But here's a, an interesting point for a public discussion, isn't it? If William Aitheling hadn't drowned on the white ship, there may very well have not been a House of Plantagenet ruling England at all. And think about this, no Richard the Lionheart, no King John and the Magna Carta, no Edward I conquering Wales, hammering Scotland, no Henry V at Agincourt, no Wars of the Roses, no Henry Richard III, and, and it goes on, you know, probably no Tudors, because they wouldn't have defeated Richard III, would they? And there's that expression, isn't there, that uh, small hinges swing mighty doors, and never is that more true than in the story of history and in particular, the history of Britain. I hope you enjoyed that story of the white ship. Until next time, take care, and I'll see you very soon.